All right, welcome back everyone for more nervous system physiology. So we're going to do something a little bit different with this video. So we're only really going to cover two slides of this presentation with this video. But this is going to be, I think, very important because we're going to see for the first time what a neural reflex actually looks like and how information is relayed to and from the brain. And we're going to see a lot of things that are going to show up again and again, things that you definitely want to take note of. And I'll be sure to mention them when they come up again. So this picture that you're seeing here is showing you how you might respond to something that I think everyone does every day. So if you start over here on the far left, you can see that we've got a shower running. So everyone likes a hot shower, right? So what you're gonna do is you're going to start the shower, you're gonna get the water going, and you're probably going to set it to hot, right? Now, before you actually hop in the shower, you're gonna do what any reasonable person would do first. You're not just going to go in Leroy Jenkins style, you're going to test the water, right? So you're going to put your hand under the water to test how hot is it, does it need to be hotter, or is it way too hot and do I need to cool it down a little bit? So what we're going to cover here is the pathway of information going from the sensory receptors in your skin of your hand, the thermoreceptors that detect the temperature of the water, and we're going to track that information as it goes to your brain and then eventually comes back around the other way. So for this particular example, we are going to operate under the assumption that the water is way, way, way too hot. So if you put your hand under very scalding hot water, what are you gonna do after you feel that it's very hot? You're gonna jerk your hand back because it's very, very hot and you wanna get your hand away from the very, very painful stimulus, right? So that is the operation that we are going to work with. So let's start over here in the far left. So we are going to start with the afferent or sensory part of this process. So don't forget, an afferent process goes from the sensor to the control center. Afferent processes go from the PNS to the CNS. So we're going to the brain here. So the first thing that we are going to do is, since the water is scalding your hand, we are going to activate a type of sensory receptor in your skin called a thermoreceptor. You have hot thermoreceptors for detecting hot stimuli, and you've got cold thermoreceptors for detecting cold stimuli. So here we're going to uh, stimulate our hot thermoreceptors. So we're going to flip back and forth between this slide and the next slide, which provides text explanations of everything. So let's go ahead and do that for number one here. So it says here, stimulation of sensory receptors creates a type of electrical potential called a graded potential in a sensory afferent neuron. If the stimulus is strong enough, an action potential will be transmitted in the direction of the CNS. So let's break down what that just said. So the first thing, the graded potential. So a graded potential, as we are going to find out later in the chapter, is not an action potential. But the graded potential tells us whether we have a strong enough stimulus that warrants actually sending a message to the brain. Not every stimulus that we detect around us warrants sending a message to the brain. In some cases, we're just kind of wasting our time. So it gets back to something that we talked about in chapter one normal ranges and set points. The type of stimulus that warrants sending a message to a control center is one that falls outside the normal range. So as we've talked about before, your skin temperature is no different. Your skin temperature has a set point of about 91 or 92 degrees. Anything well below that is going to cause you to feel a cold sensation. Anything well above that is going to cause you to feel a warm or hot sensation. If you touch something that is exactly the same temperature as your skin, you're probably not going to feel anything at all. You're not, it's like you're touching something that you can't detect uh, a change in temperature. And that is because the closer the stimulus is to the set point, the, le the weaker and weaker and weaker that graded potential is going to be. And if you're dealing with a very weak graded potential, 
you are not going to stimulate an action potential, meaning that sensory neuron will not send a message to the brain. And since you can't detect a change in temperature by touching water that matches your skin temperature, that tells you that we didn't bother sending a message to the brain, which is why you don't feel anything, right? But since we are operating under the assumption that this water is very, very hot, you are definitely going to feel that and you are going to produce a very strong graded potential that will eventually trigger an action potential to be carried through this blue axon that you see right here. So this action potential will go through this sensory neuron axon all the way over here and eventually into the spinal cord and up to the brain here. So let's move on to number two here. So the afferent signal will enter the central nervous system either through a spinal nerve or through a cranial nerve. Now, this will be something that we talk about in chapter 13, but I'll go ahead and give you the general idea here. When do we use a spinal nerve and when do we use a cranial nerve? Well, cranial nerves are mostly reserved, mostly, mostly reserved for pathways that are already very close to the to the brain. So sensory information coming from your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and your ears, things that are already very close to the brain, those are going to be the ones that tend to use cranial nerves. So the optic nerve from your eyes, the vestibular cochlear nerves from your ears, the facial and glossopharyngeal nerves in your tongue, those are cranial nerves that go directly into the brain. They don't go into the spinal cord, they go directly into the brain. However, if a stimulus exists far away from the brain, like what you're seeing here with your hand, then those are going to be the types of pathways that generally utilize spinal nerves, meaning that we're still going to get that information to the brain, but we have to go in through the spinal cord first. So that's why you're seeing this axon of this sensory neuron go into the spinal cord before it takes a pathway up to the brain. So if we are using a spinal nerve, which we are here, an interneuron will carry that information from the sensory neuron up to the brain through what is called an ascending tract, through the white matter of the spinal cord, what we saw before. Now what happens next is that the interneuron of the ascending tract is going to synapse at a particular basal nucleus in the brain, a place called the thalamus. The thalamus is going to be a very, very, very heavily utilized sensory relay center in the brain. Just about every type of sensory modality, whether it is touch, vision, hearing, taste, most type of senses are going to go through the thalamus before they are directed to the appropriate processing center in the brain. The only exception to this is smell. Smell stimuli do not go through the thalamus, but just about everything else will. So what you're seeing here, if we follow the blue pathway, we go into the spinal cord, up through that ascending tract, and then to the thalamus right here. So this that you can see right here kind of looks like a banana. That is your thalamus there. It, it is a basal nucleus. It contains a lot of cell bodies of neurons that project their axons to different parts of the cerebral cortex. So speaking of which, once we go through the thalamus, the thalamus acting as its own control center here, the thalamus will project the signal to where it is supposed to go. If it's a visual stimulus, the thalamus will project it to the visual processing center. If it is a taste stimulus, it will project it to the appropriate processing center for that. So depending on what the stimulus is, the thalamus is going to project that signal to the appropriate part of the cerebrum that it is supposed to go. So the signal will go from the sensory neuron into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord to the thalamus, and then the thalamus will send that signal to the appropriate control center in the cerebral cortex. So you can see that here. We go from the thalamus and then a cell body that is in the thalamus projects its axon to the appropriate part of the cerebral cortex here. Okay, so next, up until this point, one, two, and three here cover the afferent side of things. So as we said, the afferent side of things is only half the story here. If you place your hand under very hot water, 
you are the afferent side is you sensing that it's hot. The efferent side is what are you going to do about it? Well, we already said you're going to jerk your hand back because you don't want to burn your hand. The efferent side involves the message sent from the brain to the muscles in your arm so that you can pull your hand back. That is the appropriate response there. So from here, we are going to follow the red pathway back. So this red pathway involves motor neurons the same way the blue pathway involved sensory neurons and interneurons. So we have this upper motor neuron here. It has its cell body in the cerebral cortex. It is going to project its axon back down through the white matter of the brain. You'll notice that this efferent pathway does not go through the thalamus the way the afferent pathway did, and that is not unusual. That is actually expected. The thalamus is a sensory relay center. It is not a motor relay center. So this pathway here in red is going to skip the thalamus. We have these oligodendrocyte myelinated axons projecting down through the white matter of the brain, down through the brainstem, and down through the spinal cord. Once we get to the appropriate depth of the spinal cord, so if we're talking about your arm, we're talking about maybe right around the chest area, we are going to project that efferent motor information out through another spinal nerve so that it can go to your arm and to your hand so that you can jerk your hand back there. So to recap this, an upper motor efferent neuron will fire its own action potential and this information is sent down through the spinal cord through what we call a descending tract. At the appropriate depth of the spinal cord, meaning that we don't want to go all the way down the spinal cord because that's going too far, a lower motor neuron will then carry that efferent information through the spinal nerve, and the axon of this lower motor neuron will synapse on the effector cells, talking about skeletal muscle in your arm so that you can pull your arm back away from that painful stimulus. So that should do it for this particular video. I hope you found this helpful because any type of neural reflex that we are going to talk about from here on out is going to look almost exactly like this. It's the only things that are really going to change is what and where did the stimulus occur, and that's basically it. The sending of information, both afferent and efferent, is going to look an awful lot like this every single time. So I will go ahead and sign off for now, and I will see you next time, and we will finally, finally start talking about action potentials and the excitability and electrical activity 